Narcissist Seduction by H. G. Tudor Narrated by H. G. Tudor Chapter 1 I love you, and I always have. This was the first salvo in the unleashing of a weapon of mass seduction. That was how it began. That was the first tendril that she coiled about Ian Wynne. Well, it was the first tendril that had taken hold. She had extended a couple of snaking, searching tendrils previously. They had failed to connect, and instead bounced off their target and slithered away. He had never noticed. The failure to ensnare him no doubt resulted in protestations of indignation. She was not to be denied, however, and this attempt landed, the hooks sinking into win. The first attempt had come late on a Saturday evening, as Wynne lay on his bed watching the highlights from the day's football, the new season already in its infancy. It was a warm evening, and his bedroom windows were flung open, the city beyond. It was late summer, and for once it had lived up to its name, Baking Day following Baking Day. Wynne was dressed just in his boxer shorts, a fan whirring from side to side near to him, in order to create a draught to move the heavy, still, warm air. The chime of a newly arrived text sounded from his phone. He groped for it, not taking his eyes from watching a replay of a contentious goal which, on the eighth replay, affirmed it had been scored from an offside position. Wynne looked to his phone, and the display showed a message had been received from Ashley Havenia. He hadn't heard from his former colleague for a few weeks, not since they had bumped into one another at a mutual colleague's leaving drinks, and then met up again a little time afterwards. Wynne slid the announcement across to access the content of the message. "'Hi. What are you up to?' "'It's an odd time to ask that,' thought Wynne. His instinct for a prompt reply, instilled in him through a combination of innate politeness and trained necessity given his occupation, caused him to type his answer straight away. "'Watching the football and drinking a glass of wine. What about you?' He sent the message and placed the phone back on the cabinet beside his bed. His eyes returned to the football. There was no reply to his answer. The second attempt came the following morning. He had gone for a walk and left his phone in the glove compartment of his car. He had wanted to avoid the ping of an email from a colleague boasting that they were working on a Sunday, and instead enjoy his stroll. He regularly drove to the countryside or the coast, finding the isolation of a hill or a curving beach the ideal antidote to the frenetic nature of his working week. After a two-hour walk across two large hills and back down to his starting point, Wynne returned to his car. He picked up his phone and noted a message from Ashley Havenia. "'How are you? Only answer in the next thirty minutes.' The message had been sent at 10.10am. Wynne glanced at the display. It showed it was now 11.32am. He found the stipulation in the message rather strange, but assumed she must have been busy about something else. He deleted the message and put the phone on the seat next to him before driving home. He gave it no more thought. This time, the third attempt was launched. This was a sustained attempt which began just after 9pm on the following Friday evening. He had enjoyed a few drinks with his friends after work, and then caught a taxi home. Takeaway consumed and having showered, he was settled on his bed watching a film, and the chime of his phone caught his attention. "'Hi. How are you?' It was from Ashley. "'Hi. Fine, thanks. And you?' He replied, and dropped the phone to the bed, not particularly interested and not expecting an answer. The chime came moments later. "'I'm okay. What are you doing?' "'Watching a film.' "'Which one?' "'Wall Street. Who with?' Nobody. I am alone. I don't believe that. Wynne paused. Why would she think he was with somebody? 
She knew he lived alone. They had discussed this when they had met for a drink about five weeks earlier. Moreover, why would she care? Well, it's true, he wrote in response. Thought you would be with somebody. Why? Just do. I see. What are you doing? Nothing. Just at the top of the stairs. Kiss. Sat at the top of the stairs. Was she on the naughty step? And now a kiss. Just the one. Wynne gave a slight smile and began typing. Been misbehaving again. Kiss. Ha! No, that's you. Kiss. Not at all. I'm well behaved. Kiss. I don't believe that. Kiss. Why not? It's true. Kiss. You are a ladies man. Kiss. Says who? Kiss. Oh, they all do. Kiss. Do they now? Why are you sat at the top of the stairs? Kiss. Only place I can get a signal. Kiss. I see. Kiss. Well, that's what Ben said. Wynne frowned. What on earth did that mean? And the kiss was omitted. Ben? He asked. The message was sent, and he waited. This time there was no swift reply. Wynne searched for the control of the Blu-ray player and was about to press play to resume his film when the phone chimed again. Sorry, sent that to you by mistake. I'm talking to Blackmore as well. Kiss. Ah, Michael Blackmore, the mutual colleague at whose leaving drinks he and Ashley had met after maybe a year or so of not having seen one another. Blackmore was a serial gossip, and well known for only ever getting in contact if he wanted something. Blackmore had wanted to move to the same bank that Wynne had recently moved to. Wynne had felt like he was in a relationship with Blackmore, such was the volume of questioning texts and calls that he had received about the new bank. OK, you want to slow down with the wine. Ha ha. Kiss. I'm not drinking. Kiss. Yeah, right. Kiss. I'm not. Kiss. OK. Kiss. Wynne pressed play on the control, and the film continued. She was obviously bored, sat at home, her husband no doubt out somewhere. He watched as Gordon Gecko filled the screen, but before he could speak, the phone chimed once again. Wynne let the film play as he turned to the phone to see another message and the customary kiss at the end. I need to see more of you. Wynne paused and wondered why on earth she had written that. They were reasonable friends, having worked together for around ten years. They did not speak frequently, but when they did, the conversations tended to be lengthy, albeit they talked about political matters at work as opposed to their personal lives. He struggled to even recall where Ashley lived. It wasn't in the city, he knew that much, but he wasn't sure exactly where. The two of them had been allied to the good side in the split that had occurred at the workplace. Unfortunately, the good guys and girls had decided enough was enough in the face of monumental management incompetence, and an exodus had begun. He had left the bank some ten months ago. He remembered when he had sat in a quiet room on the floor they shared at the office and told Ashley that he had resigned. He had been slightly taken aback and admittedly touched by her saying, Don't go, please don't leave me. At the time, he attributed this to her being left in a dwindling group of like-minded individuals, concerned at one of their more outspoken members opting to find a more welcoming home, rather than face the daily torment of questioning by those ill-equipped to do so. With the arrival of the text, perhaps she had meant something more by her remark than a plea to remain solidarity. Why? I miss you. OK, we can meet up if you want to catch up. When? This week sometime. I'm up to my eyes. I had a panic attack last week. Sorry to read that explained Wynne. We will fit it in some time, then. But I need to see you, be with you. Again the kisses were on each the end of each message sent by both Wynne and Hervenio. Uh, be with you? What did that mean? Well, we will sort something out. I'm not some junior banker easily impressed by the persuasive Mr. W, she wrote. Nobody said you were. You had so many. 
So many what? Women. Ah, the rumour is greater than the reality. I've told you that before. Why not me? What do you mean? I need to go. OK, catch you later. But I want to talk to you. Well, ring me up, then, if you want. Can't. She might hear me talking. Who? My daughter. Ah, fair enough. Well, just text, then. Yes, but I need to go. Then go. I can't. Wynne shook his head. What was she doing? He decided not to reply, and instead tried to return to his film. He found, however, that he kept looking to the phone screen, hoping for a message from her. He was intrigued by the content of her messages. There was nothing. She must have finally gone. When can we meet? She was back. Some time after work would be best. I'm so busy, and I have to get so much done before we go to Spain. Well, we can meet up when you've come back. I don't think I can wait that long to see you. OK, I'm pretty flexible, so you just let me know. The message was gibberish. What? Wrote. Win. The screen remained blank. Wynne was puzzled by this sudden need to see him, and it smacked of being something more than just wanting a catch-up between friends. He was curious now. He had always thought of Ashley as quite attractive, always elegantly dressed and a bright woman, but he'd never really been drawn to her, not like he had to others in the office, even though with several he did nothing about it. He found himself idly considering what it would be like to kiss her, and then chastised himself for the thought. She was probably drunk and on her own. She would have forgotten the conversation by morning. The phone's alert, then sounded again. Sorry, she was listening. Your daughter? Yes, she's a little bugger. Well, she can't hear a text, can she? Another delay followed the sending of his text. I want to be with you. OK. I love you, and I always have. Jesus, where did that come from? Wynne lured the phone, taken aback by this sudden declaration, although he also felt a surge of interest and delight. He remembered when he had turned up the bar for the leaving drinks back in June. He was stood up, having only just entered through the rear doors of the pub, and Ashley had just walked in through the main entrance. As soon as she had seen him, her face lit up, and she made a beeline for him. She ignored other colleagues, both present and former, and grabbed Wynne, embracing him full on his lips. The warmth of her greeting had taken him aback, but he just put it down to her being pleased to see him, after a hiatus of around a year from when they had seen one another. Wynne reflected on this kiss. Perhaps there was more to it than he realised. Perhaps she wanted more. He wasn't averse to being kissed by a good-looking lady. Who wouldn't be? He tapped out a reply. We should meet and talk. I need you. I have to go. OK. I don't want to go. Then don't. But then Pilfra Tusculus. It was gibberish again. She must be pissed, thought Wynne. She's just blurting stuff out and she's starting to type nonsense. He waited. We need to meet soon. I want you, came another message. OK, we will sort something out. Promise? Yes. Got to go. OK, bye. The screen eventually faded, a further message not bringing it back to life this time. His film continued in the background but Wynne had lost interest in the machinations of Gordon Gecko and his trading. Somebody was looking to acquire him. But why? <laughs> <laughs>